You've probably heard of principal components analysis, or PCA for short. You can use it to reduce the dimensionality of your feature space, or to produce uncorrelated features. You may not know that you can also use PCA to explore the classification power of your data. I'll explain how we can use PCA to explore our data in this way. We'll see how you can compare two sets of features to understand which are better classifiers. This video is actually based on a Medium article that I wrote. If you want some deeper insight or the Python code for this project, you should definitely check it out. You can find the link in the description. We'll be using PCA to explore a breast cancer data set. If you have some experience with machine learning, you've probably already come across this data set. This data set contains 30 features based on different measures taken from cancer cells. Based on these, we're going to try to predict the result of a cancer test. That is, if a tumor is malignant or benign. Let's take a closer look at two of the features in this data set. On the x-axis, we have mean symmetry. And on the y-axis, we have worse smoothness. Malignant test results are given in red and benign results are given in blue. Remember, these features are created using measures from many cancer cells. In total, there are 10 measures and they are aggregated in three different ways. So for the mean symmetry feature, symmetry is our measure. And then we aggregate all the symmetry measures by taking the average. Going back to our two features, you can see that they do a poor job of separating malignant from benign tumors. But this is only two features. How can we use a similar technique to visualize the classification power of our data set as a whole? This is where PCA comes in. We won't go into too much detail with how PCA works. All you need to know is that our data set is transformed into principal components. The first principal component, PC1, is constructed so that it captures as much of the variation in our feature set as possible. Then principal component two is constructed so that it captures as much of the remaining variation as possible, and so on. The first two principal components can often capture a significant proportion of the total feature variation. In this case, you can think of them as summaries for the entire feature set. So we can create the same plot as before, except now we use PC1 and PC2 instead of individual features. We can now see two distinct clusters. This suggests that the data set as a whole will allow us to separate malignant from benign tumors with high accuracy. Okay, that's great. But this technique can be even more useful if we want to compare different sets of features. So let's create two subsets of features. In group one, we have all the features based on symmetry and smoothness. Group two has all the features based on perimeter and concavity measures. We want to gain an understanding of which of these groups will be better predictors. To do this, we perform PCA on each group separately. This gives us two sets of principal components. You can see the principal components for group one in the chart on the left and for group two on the right. For group one, there is some separation, but there's still a lot of overlap. With group two, you can see that the clusters are more distinct. So from these plots, we'd expect the features in group two to be better predictors. And in the article, we show that this is actually the case. A logistic regression model built using the features in group one had an accuracy of 74%. In comparison, a model built with the features in group two had an accuracy of 97%. We probably would have expected a result like this even before we started modeling. This is because PCA had allowed us to build some intuition around our features. This really helps with feature selection. The PCA charts can also be thought of as a sense check for our model accuracy. If we've got different results, we may want to go back and double check our model code. And lastly, this approach can really help with building a story around your data and models. Everyone loves a good data visualization. So we may have glossed over a few details in this video. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there's a Medium article that goes into more depth. You can find the friend link for this article in the description. The friend link allows you to read the article even if you don't have a Medium subscription. You'll also find my referred member link in the description. If you find the article useful, please consider becoming one of my referred members on Medium. You'll get access to all the amazing data science content on the site, 
and a part of your fee will go directly to me. And lastly, this is my first video on YouTube. So if you have any comments or suggestions on how I can improve them, definitely let me know. Great, thanks.